so, so much uh, for asking me to be here today. I know by virtue of the achievement that earned you uh, these seats down front today, um, that you are too smart to take advice from anyone who hasn't earned it, uh, let alone from a erstwhile Northampton morning radio show DJ. Um, I do, uh, however, have a, have a story to tell that I will admit is a little bully, uh, but I hope you'll think that it's worth it, so here goes. In June of the year 1900, a self-righteous, by all accounts, quite unpleasant woman uh, in Kansas had a religious vision. Or at least she said she had a religious vision. Her name was Carrie Nation. And years later, when she wrote her autobiography, in which she all but named herself a saint, she said that while she was praying, in June 1900, she said she was lamenting, weeping, trying to find a way to be a better Christian. She says that God spoke to her in a clear voice and directed her to go destroy saloons. <laughs> God told her to leave the town where she lived in Medicine Lodge, Kansas, to go 20 miles away to Kiowa, Kansas, and to destroy any saloons she found there. And she did. She stormed these turn-of-the-century bars, these saloons with their long wooden bars, their long mirrors, and she had a big rock, and she used the rock to smash bottles of liquor. She just laid waste to these bars. Oh, Turns out that Carrie Nation had a sort of hankering for this. She lustily enjoyed destroying property <laughs> and terrifying people. And she soon made both a habit of it and a career of it. She traveled all over Kansas first and then ultimately all over the country, destroying ballrooms, uh, smashing bottles of liquor, first with a rock and then ultimately with a hatchet. <laughs> she adopted um, the hatchet as her symbol. She called her saloon smashings hatchetations, <laughs> which it's probably the one really cool thing about Carrie Nation. Hatchetations. Um, Carrie Nation sold these tiny little pewter hatchet pins as fundraising souvenirs. Uh, you can still buy them on eBay. I have one. Uh, it looks like a Labrys, though. Like, it looks like a... Uh, it's, a um, it's a nice idea, but different. Um, Carrie Nation's fundraising was actually for herself. It was so she could promote herself as essentially a sideshow act, a saloon smasher, and she, she had a sideshow act manager promoting this traveling saloon smashing roadshow that she did all over the country. Now, a as a person who's become not a little bit obsessed with Carrie Nation, I have come to think of her mostly as an American huckster, just promoting herself. But of course she was also promoting her cause, which was temperance, outlawing drinking, prohibition. And that campaign worked. I mean, not on her own, obviously. She was one of the uh, reigning symbols, though, of the, the prohibition movement from when she started smashing saloons in 1900 until she died in 1911. And by 1917, the combined effort of activists like her and the Women's Christian Temperance Union and the Anti-Saloon League and the Prohibition Party and all these other groups, they had succeeded in passing an anti-booze amendment to the United States Constitution as if we did not have better things to do. <laughs> it passed overwhelmingly through both houses of Congress, uh, less than a year and a half later ratified by two-thirds of the states, and starting in 1920, the incredibly stupid idea of prohibition was the law of the land. <laughs> and it, it was a disaster. Mm -hmm. Alcoholism actually went up. Dozens and then hundreds and then thousands of illegal drinking establishments opened up. Bootleggers ran the black market to end all black markets. Mm -hmm. A whole new variety of organized <coughs> activity blossomed. With, with, with the massive surge of profits flowing through that criminal underworld, this country reached whole new levels of official corruption, government corruption. Things that would put anything that we've got today to shame, except maybe the Interior Department under the Bush administration. Not about the Bush. I mean, that was really. I mean, the specifics there. Remember, they put the eight-year-old guy, into the number two guy in charge of the Department of the Interior, and there was that one office where they were sorting meth off the toaster oven. And, in the office regulating the oil industry were actually having affairs with oil industry lobbyists. <laughs> so the Bush administration was here with the heart of the <laughs> <laughs> Actually, if you think about it, there was that morning last
last summer where 44 people got arrested all at once in New Jersey on corruption. Remember that? <laughs> <laughs> and then there's Rod Blagojevich. Uh. <laughs> Alright, maybe we can't imagine what super corrupt criminal government looks like, but in the old it was really bad. Oh my god, I love her. In the Depression, the criminal economy that was a side effect of the caring nations of the world convincing us to ban foods, that criminal economy was big enough that it crowded out a lot of the real economy. Trying to recover from the Great Depression meant in part trying to figure out means of stimulus spending that wouldn't just disappear into the gangster economy, which was quantitatively an actual competitor to the legitimate economy. <laughs> Now granted, we do remember some cool things from that era, flapper dresses. <laughs> um, every drink you've ever had that's made with orange juice mm. in that era because they needed something with a strong flavor to disguise the taste of the disgusting bathtub gin. <laughs> uh, but basically it was a huge drag, it was a huge public policy failure. I'll just give you one other concrete example of how barbaric and stupid this time was in American public policy. Um, consider industrial alcohol. There's alcohol for drinking, right? Which is banned at that time. And then there's alcohol for things like solvents, rubbing alcohol. People were so desperate to drink that they would sometimes drink industrial alcohol. Or people in the wildly profitable business of bootlegging would steal or rip off industrial alcohol somehow and then redistill it to make it vaguely drinkable. Well, the government decided during Prohibition that that must be stopped. And their genius idea to stop it was to poison the industrial alcohol. <laughs> uh, Deborah Bloom, who's a great writer, wrote about this for Slate.com recently. The government took industrial alcohol and they added things like kerosene, gasoline, benzene, mercury salts, nicotine, ether, formaldehyde, chloroform, acetone. They would add known poisons to these things that they knew people wanted to drink, and then, duh, people would still drink them and they would die. <laughs> it's been estimated that as many as 10,000 people may have been killed by government actions this way during Prohibition, when the government decided to discourage people from doing something that people already knew was really bad for them, but they wanted to do it anyway. Prohibition was really stupid at a million different levels. <laughs> Finally, after 13 long, dumb years, uh, we in 1933, and then we as a country promptly set about forgetting we had ever done it. I think it's important to remember Prohibition, because it was 13 long years and it was a really bad idea. But it's also important to remember Prohibition, because enacting it was a huge disaster for our nation, but it was a personal triumph for Kerry Nation. <laughs> I would like to offer the hypothesis on this beautiful graduation day that personal triumphs are overrated. <laughs> got the White House to install his on-the-take corrupt patsy as the number two job at the Department of the Interior, thus leading to the snort snorting mouth off the toaster of his meeting with the oil lobbyist's vibe at the Department of the Interior. <laughs> that was a personal triumph for Jack Abramoff. <laughs> Someone at Yum Brands this year achieved their personal triumph of getting KFC to remove the bun from the <laughs> <laughs> when the current president hit upon the strategy of co-opting his political opponent's wish list in order to get a climate bill passed this year, President Obama adopting Drill Baby Drill was lauded in the Beltway Press as a personal and political triumph for him. Someone invented the AMC Gremlin and my car company to build it for nine years. That was a personal triumph. <laughs> businessman who has mass marketed a legal means of charging 400% interest on something they call payday loans, despite laws against usury and loan sharking in this country. He has made so much money off of ripping off Americans in that way that he built himself a full-scale college football stadium with lights and seating and a field house and everything in his backyard for his personal use and he hires college football teams to play there for his own enjoyment. Oh. He markets himself as a great American personal triumph. Oh my god.
Al Capone rose from humble beginnings in Brooklyn to build a huge crime empire that essentially owned Chicago during the Prohibition, a personal triumph. All these people dream their dreams and worked hard and achieved their dreams. Bad dreams are bad dreams. like this, uh, at least in my experience, life is short. It might be. <laughs> if it is for you, I'm sorry, and I wish that was not the case. <laughs> I would caution against believing the life is short advice that you should live every day as if it is your last. As if you're only ever going to be roughly the age you are now. <laughs> Frankly, if all goes well, life's long. So, if you might take any advice from me, I would offer this. Hopefully, life is long. <laughs> Do stuff you will enjoy thinking about and telling stories about for many years to come. Yeah. Do stuff you will want to brag about. Nobody <laughs> brags to the grandkids about how they were one of the geniuses who came up with the idea of poisoning all the industrial alcohol. <laughs> Nobody's going to brag to the grandkids about having made one of the who needs wetlands, let's have a subdivision and a shipping canal instead decision. <laughs> Uh, New Orleans, the tragedy and the distant hope that it is today, and the 40% of our nation's wetlands that are Louisiana's beaten, bloody coast. Hmm. Nobody's ultimately going to brag to their kids about having told the country that we ought to invade Iraq because, you know, 9 11, and besides, it'll be easy. <laughs> Can you imagine the family history? Yeah, then granddad went on TV and said, War in Iraq would take six weeks max. Nobody wants to remember that about granddad. <laughs> If you have the choice, don't be the granddad, don't be the grandma whose, whose temporal, personal triumph is something that you only hope gets forgotten in history. In the big picture, standing at age 22-ish, or 40-ish, or 62-ish, Tom Stockers. Standing at the age you are now, at graduation, looking for your own deep water horizon. <laughs> Consider the possibility that you might very well get old. Everybody hopes that you do. <laughs> be part of good decisions, because the stuff that you do now, you will want to be bragging about when you're 90. How do you become part of good decisions? In the absence of a crystal ball? The best way to guess what is going to work out in the future, to figure out what you will be glad to have played a role in, is to get smart and get smart fast. <laughs> to take the opportunities that you've got very seriously. To continue your education, not necessarily in a grad school way, although that's awesome if you choose to do that, but in a lifelong way. Be intellectually and morally rigorous in your own decision making and expect that the important people in your life do the same, if they want to stay important to you. <laughs> not just for personal triumph for yourself, but for durable achievement to be proud of for life, is the difference between winning things and leadership. It is the difference between nationalism and patriotism. It is the difference between running for office and devoting yourself to public service. It's agreeing that you're part of something, taking as your baseline that you will not seek to reach your own goals by stepping on the neck of your community. And it also means recognizing that thinking big means thinking of your country as your community. It means coming to terms with the fact that your country needs you, Smith Class of 2010. <laughs> there will come times uh, in life and career ahead when you have to choose between integrity and more short-term temptations. You will be the press secretary who is asked to lie to the press. You will be the regulator asked to approve the drilling with the Mickey Mouse safety plan. You will be the artist commissioned to make what you suspect might be propaganda. 
The engineer pressed to use the cheaper, unsafe weld. The job applicant expected to cross the picket line. The research scientist expected to round to the nearest publishable conclusion. The spouse <laughs> tempted to cheat. The physician tempted to shill. The staff sergeant asked to keep quiet. The politician confronted with the focus group that proves how well appeals to racism poll in the district. The pundit offered the talking point. The procurement officer offered the kickback. In the short term, it's always crystal clear what advances you further, what, say, makes you famous, what gets you your boss's job, what gets you elected, what makes you rich. In the end, though, blood will out. History has a way of not remembering that some of those Iraq War era press secretaries had real talent in the White House press room, or that BP and Transocean had a real talent for drilling down to find oil deeper than anyone else. Mm. When given the choice between fame and glory, take glory. Glory has a way of sneaking up on fame and stealing its lunch money later anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Life might very well be long. Keep your eyes on the horizon and live in a way that you will be proud of. You will sleep more, you will be a better partner, you will be a better mom, you will be a better friend, you will be a better boss, and you will not have to remember any complicated lies to brag about at the old age home because you can brag about the truth of your well-lived life. <laughs> In conclusion, I'm not going to be egotistical enough to ask you to remember any of this advice. Um, I might ask you, though, to remember Carrie Nation. <laughs> Carrie Nation got what she wanted. Against the odds, the product of her hard, hard work. It's, it's not meant to be inspiring, it's meant to worry you. <laughs> you are graduating from Smith College. You are well prepared, you are poised. You are well connected, you are wicked smart, you are already a contact. Do not for yourself today, but for yourself to be proud of at the end of your life. Do not for the fame, but for the glory. Learn the difference. Do not just for your own life, but for the life of your nation that is still for all its challenges and its flaws in many ways the best hope on earth. A country that needs you and the best that you have to offer and the best judgment. Thank you very much for asking me to be here. Thank you for having already done the hard work that got you here. And please enjoy this moment. Be proud of yourselves. We're all so, so very proud of you.